HEP stars, where you can find them, what are their evolutionary tracks. And the have from Russ diagram. Then I will come to the inner rings of HEP stars, which when I say inner, I mean it's from 1 to 10 stellar radii, which is really the interesting part when considering dust formation. Then I will talk about my chemical network, which includes also dust nucleation groups. The next point, I will present a mold star, um, IKL. This is quite a good star. I will later explain why this is so good for studying dust and molecules. Then I will present my new results on, on molecules and dust clusters, as well as on the condensation phase, and also will show some brain size distribution, which I will find an outcome then. And then, as a next point, I will present a very new and preliminary project uh, of mine, which deals with a semi-regular variable HP stars. And then in the end, I come to my conclusions. Here we see two different evolutionary tracks of HB stars. This is a one solar mass star, and this is a five solar mass star. These are just sample stars. And their evolution is quite similar. I mean, here we have the, the main sequence in the Hertz from Russell diagram. I mean, this is the temperature, and this is the luminosity. And once the hydrogen in the center of the star, like in our sun, is exhausted, the um, hydrogen exhausted core begins to contract, and hydrogen continues to burn in the shell, which then expands. That is common in both in low mass and intermediate mass stars. But what is different is the ignition of helium. Here, when the core contracts in the low mass stars, the contraction is halted by degeneracy. Whereas in intermediate mass stars, um, the collapse or the contraction of the helium core is halted by the ignition of helium. So we can say low mass stars, they, they ignite Degeneratively, and intermediate mass stars, they ignited non degeneratively. So that's the basic difference between, between low and intermediate mass stars in their evolution. As a consequence, here we have core helium flashes because the, the helium burning is a very explosive kind of, of thing, with, which is caused with a trip, has to do with a triple alpha rate. And here, we, um, here the core is, um, of the helium is non-degeneratively uh, ignited, and it comes to shell helium flash. <coughs> but at the end, when we are on the thermally pulsing HEV, which is on the right upper part of the hertzsprung russell diagram, um, they consist basically of the same structure. They have an inert carbon oxygen, inner core which is not burning, surrounded by helium and hydrogen burning shells which burn alternatively and surrounded of, uh, by these shells are, is a large convective envelope. That's those two types of stars have in common. Now I will talk a little bit of, of the chemical types of HB stars. We have basically two types. M-type stars and C-type stars. I'm sorry. Um, so C-type, M-type stars, they are oxygen rich. They have more oxygen than carbon. And usually you say, okay, when we have more oxygen than carbon, all the carbon is locked in carbon monoxide. Why is that so? So now we're talking a little bit the envelope of the out, outer envelope or the outer out atmosphere of HEV stars. Why is this so? CO is a very stable molecule with a very high binding energy. And so 
basically all the carbon atoms are then locked in carbon monoxide and they don't leave any leftover carbon atoms to form something different like carbon dust or carbon molecules. Then when we have a carbon type or carbon rich AGD stars and those uh, stars are, um, have more carbon than oxygen which means that all the oxygen is locked up in carbon monoxide leaving no free oxygen over for building up molecules or dust clusters, oxygen rich dust clusters. This is a very simple picture. I will later explain why this is not the, the whole proof. And during the evolution of the HV, we, these types can also change. So for low mass stars, we have a third ray up, and this can mix carbon up to the surface and uh, increase the CO ratio. So we increase the amount of C at the surface and the amount of O remains roughly the same. On the other hand, we also can decrease the CO ratio when we have intermediate mass stars where hot bur button burning occurs and uh, thus burn the C into other products like nitrogen and um, uh, yeah, similar products. <coughs> this is just to give you an overview about HP stars and their types. Now, I will also talk about time scales because this is an also very important ingredient for AGB stars. Here up on the main sequence we have time scales from 10 to the 7 for let's say a 7 solar mass star or 8 solar mass star up to uh, 10 to the 10 years for a low mass star because low mass stars they are evolving not that fast as, as intermediate mass stars on the main sequence. Then, when the star evolves and goes to the HB, then we have roughly a time scale of a million years. Those are basically um, uh, like uh, limited by the, by the nuclear um, reaction and the availability of, of um, of nucleons for nuclear burning. Now we have a, a time between two dredge up episodes, so third, um, between two third dredge up episodes, and this is roughly 10,000 years. Don't take these numbers too exact, it's just to give you an impression of the order of magnitude. And then, what for us chemists and physical chemists is the most important point is the time between two stellar pulsations. Because the stellar pulsations, they cause dust formation and thus also cause the mass loss. This is a very important uh, number and these are of the order of a year. That depends if we are considering minor variables which have rather long periods of four or five hundred days or if we consider semi-regular variables which don't have a very well defined period but rather have shorter periods because they pulsate in the first or second overtone and not in the fundamental mode. And then we have the chemical time scale. I will shortly explain the formula which I used here. K A B is basically the rate of chemical species A reacting with chemical species B to give C and D. NA is the number density of chemical species A and NB is the uh, number density of chemical species B. And those time scales, they, they cover a whole range of times. It can occur basically spontaneously a chemical reaction in within nanoseconds or for dust formation this can be days, years almost, or, or years, yes. And because of this large, large range, we have um, a very stiff system of coupled ordinary differential equations. 
So now I come to my real topic, this is the inner wind of AGB stars. And here we see two models, one is without dust and the other is with dust. Here on this axis you see the distance from the star, and here you see the, the phase which is basically a time coordinate. And when we are moving the time and we have a model with, uh, with no dust, then you can see a stellar pulsation and it comes, pushes the matter outwards, but it comes back to an initial position. So with no dust, we basically have no mass loss when we look at, at long times because it always returns in the initial position. <coughs> when we have <coughs> dust and follow the stellar pulsation, the shocks which come from the interior from the star, and we form somewhere dust. I mean, now on this this plot is here two stellar radii, but it could be five stellar radii. This is not like it's not to scale. But when the dust is forming, or where the dust is forming, you can see that here there is a gradual outward motion. So the basic point is you really need dust to drive the wind. Um, yes, and. Due to this levitation of the atmosphere, we can have cool and dense conditions also to form inside the dust. We can also form molecules, of course. This has been studied by my supervisor and um, also other people. So, giving you an overview of the situation, we have here we have just a radial distance. Here we have a, a star. And yeah, we have here in, in the, the inside of the star, which I already told you how, how it consists. And at the photosphere, we're still hot and dense enough where we can calculate with um, chemical and thermal equilibrium, which basically um, is nice because we can form molecules without specifying the chemical reactions because it's in equilibrium. And you just need the um, temperature density and the total Gibbs uh, energy function to compute that. And we, we form CO, H2O, SiO, SO, and this is the case for oxygen rich stars. But then, when the shock comes with typical velocity of 20 30 kilometers per second, we increase the density and we increase also the temperature for short moments because this is just coming out of the conservation of mass, momentum and energy from hydrodynamics. Um, and as you can see here, due to the shocks and due to the uh, yeah, due to the shocks, we can reach very high temperatures and very high circumstellar uh, number densities, which basically also helps us to, to form dust in the molecules. And the part we are interested in is, is really from 1 to 10 our star, which is the inner wind. And because the shocks, they move outwards, I mean, of course, they, like they are damp and they lose a little bit of energy when they move outwards. But these shocks enable the formation of non-expected molecules. These are, for example, CS, HCN, CO2, because you wouldn't expect them in oxygen-rich outflows, wouldn't you? Because, as I said, CO is the only carbon-bearing molecule in the oxygen-rich outflows from the simple picture, but it is not that simple, and those species really have been detected, so they must be there and they must be explained. <coughs> and also in this region, and this is also an important point, the nucleation of dust clusters and the condensation occurs because often in the literature is used that we have a molecular layer and later we have a dust uh, formation layer and then we have the outer envelope. But this is like coexistent on the same region, the molecular chemistry and the dust which is forming out of the molecular clusters. 
And then here in, at the outer envelope we have a um, strong interstellar uh, radiation field which enables several reactions. And that's here the wind is also fully accelerated. And but this is not um, like our our topic. But we inject of course the species which which we found here we inject in the intermediate envelope. So coming to the real chemistry, what, what, what is my work basically I've, um, I've done is um, the chemical network which consists of 105 molecular species and 426 chemical reactions if I only take the, the um, gas phase and cluster reactions. And this is um, quite an intense work because you, you check all the reactions if you and twice, you have the real rates, the high temperature rates, and so on. So, as already told, we detected some carbon bearing species we wouldn't expect in, in oxygen rich outflows. And we also detect H2O, OH, SiO, and those first three molecules they are also masers and also help like, to constrain the geometry of the circumstellar envelope. And of course, we have also SIS, which is um, is an isovalent uh, thing to SIO because S, S, sulfur and oxygen, they have uh, both six outer electrons. Then, besides this, we also detect um, sulfuric oxides, and recently, just uh, one year ago, this were detected phosphorus bearing species PN and PO. And our Kinetic network contains different kinds of reactions. These are neutral neutral reactions, thermal fragmentation, collisional fragmentation, radiative association process, but currently no ions. So now you may ask why no ions? Because as I said, HV stars are cool, so they are stellar. UV field is not so strong to produce ions, and the interstellar field is not penetrating deep enough into the inner envelope. In the upper envelope is okay, but not in the inner envelope. So that's why we, we exclude them. And um, yeah, basically that's all I wanted to say about the chemical network. Now I come to the nucleation groups, which are like clusters of molecules. And mostly we use dimers of alumina, of phosphorite, which is what are magnesium rich silicates, of pure metal oxides or pure metal clusters, which is for example Fe2, Fe3, or Mg2, O2, and so on. And then as, as an example, I have here the dimer structures of Al4, O6. Those structures I was computing at the um, High Performance uh, Computational Center in Barcelona, and it was kind of a tricky thing because you can imagine if you have Al4 or 6, I mean, this, these are 10 atoms, 4 aluminium atoms, and 6 oxygen atoms. With 10 atoms, and with 10 atoms, you can already make um, a huge number of different isomers. So of different structures. Now if you go to Al8 O12, you have 20 atoms. It increases exponentially with, with, with the number of atoms you have. So you really have to, to be a little bit smart in predicting these structures. And this is done by a Monte Carlo based candidate search. I mean if you would would like compute every possible structure out of these millions of structures you can, can make and every structure needs um, 12 hours of CPU time you, you get nowhere so you have to somehow like make the first the candidate session to exclude um, isomers which, is, which are just not energetically good or are, are not, not feasible or not um, yeah, are, are not, not done. And this is done for computational cost in, the, in this Monte Carlo based candidate search works very well. <coughs> um, I've compared those structures to already published structures, and they are really. This is the gram 
ground state, and this is the first excited state of AL406 in HEV star conditions, which are relatively below 2000 degrees and, and they're considered the entities. And so, how do we form them? We basically dimerize ALO into ALO2 in brackets, and then in order to form AL2O3, we oxidize it mostly with H2O and OH. A little bit of this is also included, but O2 is not really abundant in, in uh, HP orange envelopes, so basically it's H2O and OH which oxidize and make the first ring structure of AL2O3. Then for AL2O3, it has been shown that you can monomerically addish, add these L2O3 structures to form large clusters like L406. And for the silicates, however, uh, this situation is a little bit different because there we have three sorts of atoms. We have silicon, oxygen and magnesium. So the thing is even computational more intensive, you would like consider every structure or every uh, isomer you could have. And so we looked in the literature and found a quite feasible uh, answer type of a cross right formation, formation pathway. Here the red atoms, these are uh, the oxygen atoms and the yellow ones are the silicon and the blue is the magnesium. And we, we implemented this formation route where we had to first make Si2O2 and then Si2O3, then you add the magnesium, then you oxidize it again, then you add another magnesium, and then you oxidize it again, and, then, and so forth, and so forth. So, um, and basically, it didn't work efficiently because the dimerization, so here really the first step was like the bottleneck or the limiting factor of uh, the, the cluster formation here of, of an enstatite or a phosphorite dimer. Because if, if the initial step it doesn't work, you, you can forget about the rest. And so, how to overcome this, this kind of natural barrier we have? This was done, or we looked at hydrogenated silicate, uh, silicon oxides. And so, made a combination of this scheme, which is quite recent, and this scheme, which is a little bit older, as you can see from 95. And when we include these species, HSIO and the dimer of it, and H2SI2O3, we can like contain the silicates or silicate clusters in this hydrogenated form and like bypass with this thing here, the dimerization, and directly jump to step number three. And that helps us a lot with, 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 with the cluster formation of, of uh, phosphorite dimers. And we know that phosphorite dimers are um, oxygen rich envelopes. So while implementing this in, in, in our um, chemical scheme, we see that this is an efficient me mechanism to synthesize silicate dimers between 4 and 6 stellar radii. By between 4 and 6 stellar radii, closer to the star, where we form alumina, it's just two volts. And you can imagine when also a shock comes, then it even heats up the things a little bit, and the thing cannot form efficiently. But at four and, uh, and six, between 4 and 6 stellar radii, uh, it has already cooled and the shock is not that strong anymore, so these are basically the, the loci of the, stellar, of, of the silicate formation. And I forgot to mention here, this has also been um, observed in, uh, by Karolika et al. just one year ago. And they said we, we have close to the star around about two stellar radii. We, we find alumina grains and around four to five we find phosphorite grains which is basically also the thing we find. So, I find with, with observation, we agree with observations. Now I come to <coughs> a specific pulsetron model, which is uh, 
concerns I picked out are already told by why I already mentioned that this is a good good start because it's nearby, it's galactic, it's oxygen rich, its molecular inventory has been observed and so we have abundance estimates from from observations and from line intensities and we have rotation temperatures so it's quite well studied, it's close close and to model the star you also get the uh, important parameters which in our case is, is first of all the pulsation period and then of also the temperature of course the shock speeds are very important for the chemistry the CO ratio is very important and the mass loss and the dust to gas mass ratio that's basically not an input parameter that's what, what is coming out but this kind of stuff is somehow or is, is observationally constrained except of the shock velocity and, and stellar mass but those can be obtained by theoretical considerations for example from the pulsation equations yes and it is what I also mentioned it is a fundamental pulsator so it also always pulsates in the radial direction there are other pulsators, semi-regular ones, <coughs> we'll talk later about them. They don't pulsate only in the radial direction, it's a little bit more complicated because they have first and second overtone modes which are excited. And um, yeah, the, the semi-regular variables are not that easy to know, like uh, I could tell pure periodic fundamental radial pulsation. And um, yeah, basically, this is a simplified picture as you have seen already in, in one of the first slides. And this is the, the hydro model, basically. Consider you are sitting on the shock front and are co-moving with the shock front. So you, you are in the, in the moving or in the Lagrangian frame and you see the pre-shock gas um, coming into you and um, then first we, we do um, have a chemical cooling region which is basically done by a collisional uh, endothermic reaction which cool down the gas and after this, this is a very thin layer, this is not to scale after the, the chemical cooling has heat uh, there is an adiabatic deceleration region this is a, a complex model from Bertrand de Chevalier from 1985. I mean, the paper is even two weeks older than me, but it's a very, it's a good paper and it's still valid and has analytical, uh, semi-analytical solution to the hydrodynamic equation. And um, yeah, basic outcome is that we have an exponentially decreasing temperature, as well as note that this this is a log scale here, yeah, exponential decreasing gas densities at different stellar radii they decrease with the distance from the star yes and now I show you my results on the molecules this is at one stellar radii you see here that this is the adiabatic um, cooling region we see here that the shock destroys basically the molecules and this, um, dissociate them or defragmentate them, however you want to call it. And they reform in the cooling post shock gas. And this is also the reason why we can explain species like the carbon bearing species CSHCM, which you couldn't explain by equilibrium, because when the shock comes here, you see carbon monoxide, so here the shock has passed, carbon monoxide has been destroyed partially, freeing carbon and so giving, for example, CS um, carbon to, to, to catch it. I mean, otherwise all the carbon would be locked in carbon monoxide, but because the shock is coming, he frees the carbon, which can then be used for HCN or CS. And it is really the, the, the cool
cooling, cooling post shock gas which reforms the molecules, those the molecules you wouldn't expect them. And then you see, for example, H2O that that is always um, destroyed by the shock in, into OH and H and then reforms. But CO at, at three stellar radii, you see the effect is rather small, smaller than at one stellar radii. And you see there's just some molecules which are more shock dependent and some they only feel the very first shock at the first stellar radii. And as you further move out, for example, PN doesn't feel anymore the shock at three stellar radii, whereas it feels it at one stellar radii. And it's important, again, to show chemistry. So, when we compare, when we make it not only for snapshots of different stellar radii, but we, we want to have an evolution, not only with, with the phase, but also, also with a, a radial distribution, it comes out that it looks like this. And, um, Here we have, we have a value of Cs and Cn, basically this C is, is somehow trapped in, in other carbon bearing species, but it can reform. And when we look at six star radii, where we have already formed a little bit of dust, we compare the observational abundances with the observational abundances and see that it agrees basically quite well, except now for SO2, which also has a quite large error range of observation, but okay, here, yeah, you can say it's different by two, three orders of magnitude. <coughs> I would say it's, it's a quite, uh, well, a good agreement between observations and, and our model. Why we are taking this at six stellar radii, yeah, this is because, yeah, after six, it doesn't happen so much anymore. And if something is happened, it's due to that the dust is forming, and so we want we just chose the six stellar radii because there it's like the limitation of, of, of our own. So when really dust has formed, then you have to consider then also different stuff. Again, it shows a strong impact of the shocks um, on the gas of the solid phase. <coughs> um, looking at the cluster way of alumina again, which is close to the star, you <coughs> can see here, like AF406 the dimers, they are increasing at late phase at one stellar radii. This is in the cooling post shock gas, and the gas has become lower than 2000 K, which is, agrees also with laboratory experiments, which tell that aluminum oxide or alumina is one of the first dust condensates to emerge from AGD stars due to its high rarefactory, which means that it is thermally stable, more stable than silicates. That's why they're um, earlier, they form earlier. So, yeah, there we have, as I already told, LO, the dimerization and the oxidation by OH or H2O. And we have also included ALOH, but it does not really participate in the AL406 or so in the alumina uh, formation. And that's why also its abundance is a little bit higher than what was observed in some oxygen rich. Um, Myras, so it could be also used in the future to build up alumina grains in order to match also the disavance a little bit better. <coughs> For the silicates, the situation is different as I already told you. We have um, we cannot form silicates close to the star because of the high temperatures. But here you can really see that that dimer of phosphorite, which is the, our main silicate, really strongly forms at 3.5 stellar radii and then like, almost stays constant um, in, the, in the further evolution. And you can 
can see here all only compounds Si2O2. This is only feasible because of the um, inclusion of the hydrogenated SiOs, the HSiO and H2SiO. Otherwise, we couldn't even like make these dimers that high there. And if we, if we don't have dimers, we cannot even form the Mg4 Si2O8. Um, now we come, I only spoke about dust clusters, which you can still track, you can still say AL8, O12, so you can still count the atoms. Now we come to dust condensation, which consists of thousands to millions of atoms, and there you somehow, you, you cannot track any atom anymore, and you have to make several assumptions, otherwise you, you're getting nowhere. And one assumption is that you have spherical grains, which is not really true for the small clusters, but we have a transition for tetramers and uh, dimers and trimers, where we said there's a transition between dust, uh, between cluster and dust grain. And um, this is um, described by a thermal motion with a um, brown motion, and uh, yeah. For example, if they have to have basically the right thermal speed to stick to each other. If they're too fast, they like destroy each other. If they're too slow, they cannot really attach to each other. So it's it's kind of, of um, um, right with of thermal velocity thing that they the dust grains are forming. And in order to do that, uh, with, or the results out of that, you can derive grain size distribution for alumina as well as for silicates. And they still preserve the stoichiometry, but we cannot count the atoms. So in alumina grains, we, also, we know we have uh, three, three third of, of um, more oxygen than alumina. Uh, preserve. So, in the silicates in par particular, we see that the molecules which build up um, try to destroy and reform in the cooling post shockers. And the dust, particular for the silicates, is not that affected anymore by the shocks because the, the, the silicates, they, they are a fourth type stellar radii that forms, and they <coughs> keep growing over several pulsation periods. And if you include like small drift velocities, you can use more pulsation each radii. And that helps the the grains to form because they just the time scales are longer. And for this we choose close to the start a slow drift velocity because we have a um, gravitational potential which is strong close to the star and a little bit larger for, for the silicates. Um, here is the result, one grain, grain size distribution of the of alumina at one cell array and we can see we already form after this is the first pulsation, third pulsation, you can see Already after a few pulsations, we have quite large grains of the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 microns or 2000 angstroms. But, okay, the dust to gas mass ratio is a bit low, but that only concerns the alumina grains. Now, if we move to the phosphorite grains, we see that they form in already quite high amounts, and we move go up to 10 stellar radii, we have already 2.3, 10 to the minus 3 of the gas to gas mass ratio, which is consistent basically with, with observations of oxygen rich AGB stars. Okay, IK tau is a little bit higher, as 2.10 to the minus 2, but they have a large uncertainty factor, and other oxygen rich AGB stars, they have a um, a little bit a lower dust to gas mass ratio. I mean, this, this order of magnitude is, is our goal that, 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 that what is observed. And the problem here with, with the silicates is that the, the sizes of the, the grain.
strength is a little bit too small. Usually you say you would have like 0 0.1 micron, which is this number here, and here should be like the peak of the distribution. But okay, how to explain or type pass or how we can make our uh, brains larger? <coughs> this we can do if we artificially increase the density. This is a quite high density, this is a factor of 10 increase of the photospheric, uh, photospheric density, which means that all densities in the subsequent consideration of, of, the, of the inner envelope are increased by a factor of 10. So it is not that physical, let's say, from constraint parameters, but just a, a test model. And we can see that this increased density form that large grains, we even can increase our dust to mass ratio. And why are we doing this? I mean, we could also say, okay, we have sometimes not so homogeneous, uh, not at all homogeneous winds, and we have kind of clumps or clumpy structure. And this inhomogeneous wind could help. I mean, I said again, be careful. It's probably a too high density to start with dust um, just to, to explore a little bit also the parameter space and to see what, what, what it is. And the time makes you larger than larger grains but not sufficient enough. So it's also a density reason. Mm -hmm. Now I come to my very new and preliminary object. So we have a um, AGB stars in different classes, and these classes are defined in the general catalog of variable stars, which you can access online and look what, what type, which luminosity, and so on. Have uh, these, these stars, very different star sources. These are the Maya variables. Maya variables are, for example, IK tau is a Maya variable. These are pulsating in the fundamental mode. Then we have SRA and SRB stars, semi-regular A and B, but they have a first and second overtone mode pulsators and are rather on the early AGB. And then we have a class which is called L, and they are irregular variables. The basic problem on the GCVS is that they are rather loosely defined. They are defined by the, the amplitude, the amplitude of pulsation. And um, so SRAs has been found out. SRAs are not um, is, is kind of a mixture of Myra variables, which only differ from Myras by their um, pulsation and uh, by their by their amplitude. And some kind of the SRAs are similar or SRB like. So. Basically, this class is not a known class. You can somehow split it into SRB and Myras. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, I said, I mean, loosely, it's the GCBS is, is, is defined. It's just based on observations, and later people found out what are the theoretical backgrounds of this, and that's why this classification is, I call it loosely, but. And here, as I already said, and we, the temperatures are that that we um, are a little bit higher. We are earlier on the AGB. This also means the stellar masses are higher because they did not lose yet so much mass in form of dust and gas. The pulsation periods in the radii and for low mass stars, the CO ratios are smaller. That just comes from the evolutionary tracks I showed you at the beginning. And the luminosities are rather small because they are not on the tip of the HB, but this is um, not exclusively. I mean, this trend is not, let's say, don't do too much weight on, on the luminosities because the, there are also SRBs which are more luminous than Myras, although the Myras. And then also here, here we can use an infrared uh, period luminosity relation to estimate the, the luminosity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's just this period and luminosity and the K and um, H and I guess. 
So these are my very preliminary results. We have here an SRA case, which is rather uh, an SRB-like SRA with a higher temperature. And there's something wrong with, with the plot. I'm sorry, you can see the thing. But what, is, what we see here, depending on the shock speed, the chemistry, which is basically controlled by H2 and H, because these are the most abundant elements, um, H2 and H are, is dominated, is, is controlled by the shock speed. In 10 kilometers, we have H2 is dominating. And here we have the blue one, you see H is dominating, leading to a um, different chemistry at larger radii, 3, 4, 5 stellar radii. And when we look at this star and use the same model as for the Myras with the different parameters, you see that uh, the alumina transforms also in, in some size, but silicates do not form. The reason for this is because semi-regular variables that have um, a very short scale height. They, so it means the density drops very quickly after the photosphere down. And so at 3 and 4, usually where this, the silicates forms, the density is so low and then nothing happens anymore. Like not enough collisions may occur. And uh, so, yeah. But alumina, since it's still very close to the star, it can form. And we have also considered an S star, which is this kind of tradi a transitional object between oxygen and carbon rich stars. And in S stars, we can form large grains, phosphorite, large grains of um, alumina. And yeah, this is the molecular uh, plot, and you can see here it's very dominated by H2, which is 90% of all particles. Yes, this is, but so I to say it's preliminary, it's not, it's not published. So. Yes, I will come to my conclusions. Um, the molecular abundance is except SO2 is nicely explained by our shock induced chemistry. Uh, formation of large alumina grains at radii close to the star and of silicates not that close to the star but at 4, 5, 6 uh, radii with a new uh, route involving HSIO which somehow bypassed the bottleneck for the SI2O2 dimerization. And yeah, okay, here I have it. I already mentioned this paper, Karolikova measured exactly this, that at two stellar radii we form alumina grains at four or five stellar radii. They measure uh, the silicates. And the dust synthesis seems then also to agree with the talking this chemistry and also with the observations. And it shows the importance of the stellar pulsations uh, and the shock in event. And other dust formation models, they lack the pulsations, so they cannot explain the unexpected species. And yeah, somehow the pulsations are somehow also needed to form the dust grains. And so in my point of view, they are missing the most important We have these large silicate grains which form when we enhance the gas density, which may be unphysical but can be like argumented with the, with the clumpiness of the envelope structure. And yeah, our derived dust to dust mass ratio agrees with our observations. Now, see what I have time to before I finish my PhD, uh, maybe I also investigate the spinel. Spinel is somehow. Um, a magnesium rich alumina, so it's MgAl2O4, so it's kind of a mixture of silicates and alumina. So it could be like when alumina grains and silicates grains could come together, that they like build up this thing. It would be nice to, to do that. Um, as I showed you, the chemistry along the HB, where we have semi regular and first overtone pulsators and we also want to consider 
various metallicities with um, basically low metallicity case input of the fruity elemental uh, yields. Um, thank you for your attention. Shown that the uh, uh, formation of uh, chemical species that you have in the case of semi regular values so depends on the input velocity that you assume 20 or 1 or 10 km per second. In the case of fundamental mode, you have made the simulation, you have understood for 20 km per second how much of the result depends on the initial velocity of the case, the velocity that you assume for the shock. So, for, for the, for the IK12, for the fundamental mode, we don't have the problem that we, we get, um, we always H2 dominates, so we are still molecularly dominated. But now, um, with the semi-regular variables, I just realized, okay, we, we have, um, for, for this 20 kilometers uh, per second shock speed, we, we still get this H, and I'm still not sure why it roughly then becomes atomic, but I could imagine that is, it is a time effect that because the semi-regular uh, variables they have a shorter periods so in the post-shock gas the H2 have not enough time to reform and that may be the reason but I have to check this Second question is uh, I, I'm not an expert on this but I think that the, the, um, the formation of the different chemical species depends on the temper temperature stratification that you have in your lab so, the question is, at each cycle, at each transitional cycle, the, your code computes again the opacity stratification inside this region, accounting for grains, the grain yes. orientation, and so on. No, we don't have opacities yet because we would relax somehow of uh, radiative transfer. Oh. Oh. So, it's, it's a pure chemical. And the curiosity, but just naive, I noticed that in the, in the distribution with the radius of the grain, uh, there is a sharp discontinuity in radius at around 100 uh, angstrom. What is the reason? Um, For instance, in the plot, uh, there was another plot that was more clear. The, now, the one on the, this one, you see there is, there is a discontinuity in radius, in the trend with the radius around 3, 30, 40 angstrom with the radius. What is the reason? You mean this? this? Yes, it's a jump. If you have, for instance, uh, at the six radius, uh, the dash the line is up, and mm -hmm. seven radius is down by order of magnitude. Yes, because the smaller grains go into the larger grains. And because it's a log scale here, you don't really see where, I mean, you would maybe expect that you would have less, less grains at the yellow line than compared to the red dotted line, but it's not so. The small grains deplete in order to form larger grains and, and shift to the right, yes. But why do this is completely radius so strong from six to seven radius? Um, yeah. Basically, yeah, because this is the time effect and then, yeah, that the, the small the grains form. So basically, I guess when, when for three, four, five, six, you still have like a, an input of dimers, and then after six, the gas sensitivities are so low that you don't have any more this input. So then you like the, the system is closed um, from from new dimers which which are accounting for, and so you just start then at this point shifting to the right. And at three, four, five, you still can like supply dimers. More questions? I have a question. Um, well, I didn't see any trace of, for example, sodium or fluoride. Uh, Is it because they are not observed, or the uh, sodium we have? In, I guess I have thought that I have salt. But I have sold uh, NHCL. Okay. Um, so I took it, I took it, I'm sorry, I, I thought I had it. Yeah, yeah, here you have it. So 
CL, NaCl, and Cl2. And Cl2 is sorry before me, but HCl. And the same for fluorine because it's also um, a halogen compound. And most of the fluorine is in HF. 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 This is the molecule which is forming this. I haven't plotted here, but it is quite similar to HCl. 